If you haven't checked out the other video in this series, uh, make sure to check out the part one on desire, which also includes the general overall information on female desire, arousal, and orgasms. And then it contains the desire portion in this three-part series. This episode will be on arousal, and then there will be a separate episode on orgasm. So make sure to watch the other videos in this series and um, we'll get right into things. Um, like I said, this episode is on arousal. So here is some general information on arousal before we get into um, the details, like the, the finer details of things. So arousal by definition is the physical manifestation that our body displays, such as lubrication, increased breathing, throbbing feelings, um, heat, feelings of heat from our body, etc. So it's those physical manifestations. Generally, desire comes first, um, but not always. Um, in the last episode, I did talk about something called spontaneous and uh, versus responsive desire. Um, so while in spontaneous desire and arousal, the desire portion would come first. You have thoughts about um, some ex sexual activity or you see somebody that's attractive or you're thinking of a situation and that will then lead to arousal and the physical manifestations. Um, but then there's times where, um, especially for females, where during mid-cycle, we can have arousal first <laughs> because of where our hormones are, or if we're having responsive desire and arousal, then um, the physical manifestations uh, might start before the mental desire aspects really kick in into gear, right? So it's the physical manifestations. Um, desire and arousal a lot of times can get um, intermingled and thought of as one in the same or used interchangeably. Technically speaking, desire is more of the, of the mental and arousal is more of the physical. Genital arousal is dependent mostly upon the proper function of the neuro, the endocrine, and the vascular systems. If any one of these is not functioning properly, you can, not always, but you can have issues with arousal. So like, for example, endocrine, there's a lot of um, different hormones, not necessarily sexual hormones, but hormones that are in play. Um, endocrine issues can affect um, the vascular system. The vascular system can then in turn infect the neurological system. So those three systems are um, have an interplay. They each have their own individual effects on these sexual response mechanisms. So you can see there's a lot of ways that things can go wrong, but there's a lot of things, a lot of ways that things can go right. So just keep that in mind that um, just because one aspect may be an issue for you doesn't mean that you're going to have a sexual functioning problem. Serum oxytocin levels are generally reduced in the luteal phase. Um, which is the second half of the menstrual cycle. And it, this is correlated with lower scores on the lubrication scales on the sexual, on the female sexual function index. In the second half of the menstrual cycle, in the luteal phase, the serum oxytocin levels are reduced. Um, so meaning that a lot of our vulvar and vaginal lubrication is dependent on like many different things. It's dependent on estrogen, testosterone, um, oxytocin, which as you can see here, um, estrogen increases the expression of oxytocin and its receptors. So while our lubrication is dependent on oxytocin, oxytocin is obviously um, greatly affected by our estrogen levels. And there's also a, a big misnomer about estrogen being low in the luteal phase. Um, this is actually incorrect. If you Google the menstrual cycle phases and the um, sex hormones in the female menstrual cycle, you'll see that estrogen and progesterone 
both rise in the luteal phase. What I think where the, the, the mistake happens is that what happens in the luteal phase is that progesterone inhibits the effects of estrogen on the body. And so somehow that got turned into estrogen being low in the luteal phase. So that's not actually correct. So they're both rising, both rising, but progesterone, like I said, is dampening the effects of estrogen on our body. It's still there. We just don't notice the effects as much. So when we are climbing to mid-cycle or ovulation, depending on whether you're on birth control or not, um, the estrogen is obviously ri rising, in, not impeded by progesterone, because it's just the estrogen and testosterone, but that's not important right now. Um, but the estrogen is rising, thus also increasing the oxytocin and a lot of other things. Um, but for this point specifically, it's increasing oxytocin, which is having a huge effect on our lubrication. Estrogen also influences our vascular function. You will hear of women who are in menopause who may uh, get put on estrogen for um, cardiac health reasons. Um, our estrogen plays a big role in our vascular health. Um, in males, testosterone plays a big role in their vascular health. So estrogen also has a direct effect on our genital anatomy apart from how things are formed in the womb. Um, it, it has an effect on the vaginal structures from puberty all the way until the estrogen stops at menopause um, and then the lack of estrogen then affects vaginal anatomy. But um, for this episode's purpose, the estrogen is having an effect on the vaginal epithelium, the plumpness of the vagina. It enhances peripheral blood flow and it improves vaginal lubrication. A little side note about this is without estrogen, the vagina becomes drier, but it also experiences um, a lot of atrophy. And that is kind of when the tissues themselves not only dry out, but there's not as much blood flow, there's not as much elasticity, um, there's not as much healing. The layers of the dermis in the vagina become much thinner. Estrogen has a lot of effects on vaginal lubrication via nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is responsible for the smooth muscle relaxation and is also a potent vasodilator of clitoral tissue. And so just like a male's penile erection, the blood vessels and the tissues and the smooth muscles need to dilate and relax and need to relax in order for blood to flow to those areas more intensely. Without the estrogen, um, whether you are on birth control, which affects your estrogen significantly, or whether you're menopausal, or whether you're having another health issue that is affecting your estrogen production, um, without the estrogen, your nitric oxide levels aren't going to be as responsive or responding properly. And so, um, blood flow and muscle relaxation just isn't going to happen as it would as if you had proper estrogen. And this is a big thing um, for transgendered uh, people who may might be doing things to suppress their estrogen. And if you're noticing any issues with um, vaginal function, uh, make sure to talk to your doctor about the effects that you might be experiencing by suppressing your estrogen. Something, so a little bit of um, scientific jargon here that we have that I wanted to put in is the, later, the lateral orbital frontal cortex becomes less active during sex. Okay, this is the part of the brain that is responsible for reason, <laughs> decision-making, and value judgments. 
The deactivation of this part of the brain is also associated with decreases in fear and anxiety. And as you can see here, that is from clinical psychologist Daniel Schur. I'm not sure quite how to say that, but I'm guessing it's Schur. You've probably noticed when you go to have sex that um, when you're horny and you're fully aroused, you're probably not making the best judgment calls. Um, condom, who needs a condom, right? I mean, you, you know, definitely should be wearing a condom, but when you're in the heat of the moment, a lot of times those judgment calls don't get made. And when you are no longer horny and aroused, you start thinking back of what you just did. And maybe it wasn't the greatest idea. Um, some of them are great ideas and some of them aren't, but this is what, ha what is happening. So the lateral orbital frontal cortex becomes less active. And so you're, you just aren't having uh, the greatest judgment when you're horny and aroused. Uh, that was a cool little bit to put in there. Um, so she goes on to say that the, this shutdown of the lat lateral orbital frontal cortex actually makes sense as fear and anxiety can interrupt arousal and lead to problems like performance anxiety. Now to clitoral anatomy and its role in female orgasm during vaginal penetration. Um, I'm going to be kind of freestyling a lot of this as we are kind of learning um, some things about the clitoral anatomy the last few years. And so while there is a lot about it, um, it hasn't been studied a whole lot. We are, like I said, learning a lot of new things about the clitoral anatomy and its function during orgasm and during sex lately. And frankly, there just hasn't been a whole lot of studies done on how it functions. I mean, there's been some, but not ex as extensively as other things that have been studied. So um, first I'm going to pull up some of the clitoral anatomy that I have here, some visual aids. As you can see, we've got some basic structures. Um, there's a lot more that goes into the clitoris, but here's some basic structures. You have the hood, the fascia, the dorsal nerve. The corpus cavernosum is where the blood flow, makes this just a little bit smaller so you can see my face. The corpus cavernosum is where the blood flow kind of, where it comes from, kind of like in the penis, there are the veins in the penis as well, where this is this is where the blood fills. The, the, clit, the clit actually becomes erect when the female is aroused. Um, you have the deeper arteries. You can just kind of see some general stuff here, the, the nerves. So there's that one. And then, so I'll get rid of that one. And then I'll add, I have another one here. So you can see here the vulva, itself and the vestibule, how the structures are beneath all those mucous membranes. Um, so you can see the vaginal opening, then there the urethra, um, and then you have it that so it started at the top with the clitoris, um, and then it has like a wishbone, right? It's got like this wishbone structure, and then it has these two bulbs that surround the vagina. Right, and so um, that's going to come into play a lot when I'm talking about how the clitoris comes in, comes into play with, with vaginal penetration and orgasm. So um, there's those two. Okay, so we're gonna just start talking about those anatomical structures and how they play a role in things. Um, the clitoris has erectile tissue and you saw that in the clit dissection. Let me pull that back up here and just make this guy a little bit smaller. You can see the erectile tissue. And this is why the clitoris becomes engorged and swollen and harder when aroused. Um, it's filling with blood, plain and simple. It's very similar to a penis, um, but not exactly. Um, it's just similar. Um, a little fun fact, we also have erectile tissue in our nasal passages and a lot of times people may notice that they um, will get a runny nose or the sniffles when they're aroused. We have erectile tissues in our sinuses and, our, and in our nose here and so when you're aroused those are also engorging with blood. So not only is it putting pressure on your sinuses 
put all of that pressure on the blood vessels and on the structures in there, in the tissues, is causing sort of like a serum or a transudate to kind of leak out of those tiny blood vessels and capillaries and so you get a runny congested nose and that's um uh, that was kind of an interesting fact. So to finish out the clitoral aspect um, of this little bit is obviously any kind of stimulation even if it doesn't result in an orgasm any of that clitoral stimulation is going to just further arouse, it's going to stimulate all of that lubrication that is needed for penetration. Um, it's going to create the muscle tension to create the orgasm. So while there's obviously other aspects that can arouse the female, the clitoris is a huge portion of where the physical manifestations of our arousal come from. Moving on from that, nipple stimulation. So there's a massive amount, upwards of about 80% of the female population that need nipple stimulation to achieve orgasm. And I know that this is the episode on arousal, but that was just a little um, bullet point there. So we'll cover real quickly some of the arousal disorders before we get into um, what is happening during arousal. So we have something called persistent genital arousal disorder, which is characterized by persistent or recurrent unwanted or intrusive distressing feelings of genital arousal or being on the verge of orgasm, not associated with concomitant sexual interest or thoughts of fantasies. Um, I'm pretty sure I said that word wrong. <laughs> I don't use it very often. Um, it's late at night here. So uh, honestly, I don't even care. Um, Google it. Sorry. Uh, but it's basically that you are constantly feeling aroused, like really aroused and on the verge of um, orgasm and you're not wanting to. Like these are these are people who are constantly trying to just get through their day and they're on the verge of orgasm the whole time. Sometimes that might feel like it would be kind of cool, but wait till you have it. People are like, no, <laughs> can I just work? Um, it is hypothesized that the um, PGAD results from hyperactivity of the sacral nerve roots. Um, this is something that is still being studied. It's kind of new-ish. The theory that a lot of people, that a lot of those in the scientific and medical community are going with, is a sacral nerve root issue. Um, there are some other theories, but I didn't want to get too far into them. Those are things. If you feel that, that this is something that might be happening for you, I strongly suggest seeking out a sexual health sexual health specialist. So, female sexual arousal disorder is the an inability to develop or maintain an adequate genital response, including vulvovaginal lubrication, engorgement of the genitalia, and sensitivity of the genitals associated with sexual activity for a minimum of six months. If you're feeling the inability to have any of these things, um, despite trying to have them for six months or more, um, a diagnosis of female sexual arousal disorder can be made. It can be vascular injury or dysfunction. It can be caused by neurological injury or dysfunction. So there's obviously a couple of things that can be happening here, but generally the disorders that are listed on the outline here um, come with a minimum of six months and you'll see that. Um, and again, if you have any of the things listed here or any other issues that I might not even cover, make sure to, to either contact me to get help finding a proper sexual health specialist or Google one for in your area. Um, the female congenitive arousal disorder is the difficulty or inability to attain or maintain adequate mental excitement associated with sexual activity as manifested by problems with feeling turned on, engaged, or and or mentally sexually aroused. And this issue lasts for about six months. Again, the female genital arousal disorder is psychological, cardiovascular, cardiovascular, neurological, and other such as anatomical changes that may occur after pelvic radiation and or surgery. 
Symptoms are similar to genital urinary syndrome and vulvovaginal atrophy. So if you don't have things that are causing you genital urinary syndromes or vaginal atrophy, then a diagnostic of the other, of the, um, what did I call it? Then a diagnosis of female genital arousal disorder may be able to um, be used. Even after adequate stimulation, women are distressed or bothered by a lack of swelling of the labia and or clitoral tumescence, vaginal lubrication, and or increased sensitivity in the genital tissues. So you can see where this one is actually pretty common. Um, I would say that there is, there's probably a lot of women that experience this um, at some time in their life. It might not go on for six months at a time. It might come, come and go throughout your life. But I deal with women who experience this a lot. Um, it's pretty common. FGAD with reduced sensory information is I cannot feel my vagina, I cannot feel my clitoris, and I cannot feel my labia when they be, are being touched. So that's the sensory aspect, right? So some women may have a hypofunctioning sacral spinal nerve root. Here's another one of those words that it's too late at night for. Um, radiculopathy was in the cauda equina from various sacral and lumbar pathologies. <laughs> I clearly got this from one of my books, right? Another thing that can affect arousal ability is obesity and metabolic syndromes and cardiovascular issues. Um, they have an effect on sexual desire and arousal having a negative impact associated with increased vascular resistance in the clitoris and impaired arousal. Um, if you remember back to the clitoral anatomy that we talked about, we have the, the, t the two tubes, the two blood vessels that we're all, you know, that blood flow and congestion is coming from. Well, if you've got an obesity or, or metabolic uh, syndrome or cardiovascular issue, you're not gonna get the level of arousal that you could be getting. I've had a lot of women ask how they know if they're aroused. We all obviously have an idea of, um, you know, how we feel when we're aroused. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know generally um, because it can't really be talked about in K-12 sex education. Um, and so there's things that women are like, like, I know when I'm horny, but how do I know when I'm properly aroused? How do I know when I'm ready for penetration or, you know, ready to go further, right? And so we're kind of going to get into a lot of what female arousal looks like and feels like and is all about. So there's some basic indicators. Um, the vulvovaginal lubrication, which is the vaginal fluids and secretions of the periurethral and bartholin's glands. Um, unfortunately, those who are on hormonal birth control will see a mild to significant decrease in fluid created or any other physical and or mental indicators of arousal due to the negative feedback loop to the HPO axis and sexual hormone and attenuation. Um, so due to how hormonal birth control works, it attenuates the HPO access stimulation of sexual hormones. Not every woman experiences these side effects, but a vast majority do. Um, anywhere from mild, like I said, mild to significant decrease in vaginal lubrication, vaginal arousal, um, vulvar arousal and lubrication. Other indicators of um, female arousal is genital enlargement. Things are filling with blood and um, getting vascular congest congestion, and so there's going to be enlargement, clitoral enlar enlargement, labial enlargement. We'll get into some more of this, the specifics later on. There is increased sensitivity of the genitalia, erection of the nipples, flushing of the skin, increases in heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. The other aspect of how do I know when I'm aroused kind of ties into how do I know when I'm ready for penetration? Well, that's kind of subjective. That is, um, it's when you're mentally ready, honestly, um, because not everybody has a 100% f 
fully functioning sexual response. And so one person might be extremely turned on and aroused and want to have that, that physical vaginal penetration, but their vagina and their vulva isn't cooperating as well as they would like it to and creating as much lubrication as they would like it to. And that's where you just bring in some lube or some coconut oil, right? Um, and so being ready for penetration is subjective. Just because you might have a highly lubricated vagina and vulva also doesn't mean you're ready for, for, ready for penetration. You might not be mentally ready. So um, ready for penetration is subjective and I would say it's more mental because if you are not mentally ready for that, um, that can cause its own host of problems later on. Subjective arousal is how a subjective arousal can cause someone to feel very aroused mentally, like I was just saying, but the genitals are not responsive, responsive as the person believes them to be and vice versa. The genitals can be fully aroused, but the brain is not being responsive. What is the vaginal fluid made of? Vaginal lubrication is derived from several sources, including vaginal transudate and fluids from the upper rep reproductive tract, such as the cervical mucus and endometrial and tubal fluids. The chemical composition, however, of vaginal fluids is represented by a mix of ions. I, um, I think that sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, glycerol, lactic acid, acetic acid, and glycogen. I think I got my periodic table of elements right there. I'm pretty sure <laughs> I did this outline a few weeks ago and honestly, I can't remember. I forgot to, I forgot that was in there as the symbols and not written out. So I think I got those right. Um, but vaginal vas vasocongestion enhances the production of lubricating fluids. And I mentioned a lot of the vasocongestion in the desire episode and the uh, well, the part one where it was a general overview and desire episode. Um, but basically it's all that blood flow is like congesting that area, all those tissues, all the, all the blood vessels, right? That's what the vaginal con vessel congestion is. And then it's enhancing the production of lubricating fluid. This fluid primarily consists of plasma transudate that comes from capillary dilation. Plasma transudate and the transudate that passes through the vaginal epithelium on the vaginal mucosa. So as all of the blood vessels and tissues that make up the vagina are filling with blood via vessel congestion, um, all that plasma is leaking out of the capillaries and that leaking um, let's see if I can pull up the vaginal lubrication, lubricating, where it says lubricating droplets. Okay. So you see the vagina, um, network of blood vessel, where it says network of blood vessels, where that's where all the vessel congestion is coming from. And then the plasma leaks out of those blood vessels into the vagina. And that's where the lubrication comes from. Moving on. Vibrators, vibrators. Uh, I have been shown to increase blood flow to the genital tissues. It's kind of like either like a, like a back massage or a vibrating massage chair or pad or rubbing the skin. It all increases blood flow to the area, right? Um, it increases the temperature of, of the genital tissues. Vibrators also decrease some of the bother, some peripheral symptoms of low arousal with in women with FGAD. And so, um, one, never be ashamed if you need or want to incorporate a vibrator. And um, if you are a sexual partner of a female who wants to use a vibrator, don't ever shame her for wanting to use it. It's clearly helping her um, become more aroused and hopefully getting to the end goal of an orgasm. So win-win for everybody. It isn't a testament to your penile size or your lovemaking abilities. It is, you know, for all you know, she's having uh, an arousal disorder and doesn't want to talk about it with you, but the vibrator makes her function properly 
and it has something to do with you. So there's that. Um, there should never be any, any shame for wanting to use a vibrator. It's a great tool to have a normal sex life. Now we're going to move on to some more um, greater detail of the female extra genital response. So in the breasts and nipples, in we're going to go through different phases um, for the most part. I think there might be a couple of spots where I don't go through each phase, but for the most part, we're going to go through the phases. So the breasts and the nipples during the excitement phase, the nipple erection is the first evidence of the breast response to sex tension increment as a result of involuntary contraction of muscular fibers within the nipple structure. Large nipples usually have relatively less capacity for size increase, for gaining size increase, and small nipples have little capacity to respond to sexual stimulation with a measurable increase in size. Nipples frequently do not achieve a state of full erection simultaneously. Um, but when a female is aroused, the nipples become erect and a lot of times get a little bit darker, to be honest, because of the, um, the blood flow and the heat. It might be shown later um, somewhere else, not in the, it doesn't look like it's in the breast section, but there is a sex, sex flush that happens. So there's heat that, um, because of all the blood flow that's happening. Usually the nipple of the smaller breast will be the first to become fully erect. Breast size a lot of times also increases due to engorgement from vasocongestion, except in those who have breastfed. Um, the data that we have on the studies that we've done is just that the people, women who have breastfed, just the engorgement just isn't there. Uh, upon late excitement phase, engorgement nipple tension can be so great as to impinge on nipple erection, creating the illusion that the responding woman has lost nipple erection. So engorgement of the breast tissue is putting pressure on things um, and just causing different flows that um, nipple tension or nipple erection is, is itself um, lost. And so it isn't just like this, these pointy, <laughs> It's no longer these pointy, like, you know, pencil erasers. It kind of flattens out a little bit because of um, breast engorgement. Um, during the plateau phase, nipple erection can fluctuate based on the nipple tension. During orgasm phase, the nipple erection also can fluctuate based on nipple tension. During the um, resolution phase, the nipples return to the resting non-erect state as well as the breasting engorgement. The sex flush can um, happen, it happens throughout all the phases, but it gets, um, it increases throughout the phases and then obviously resolves during the resolution phase, but it can be a measle-like as orgasm nears, it, it, be, it can be that significant and it spreads from the chest outward as the arousal peaks to orgasm. Myotonia, which is essentially muscle tension, um, during the late excitement phase and plateau phase, myotonia is clinically obvious during the late excitement and plateau phase and is usually the muscle contracting with regularity or in spasm in an involuntary manner. You might notice when a female or male is highly aroused that their hands or feet start um, flexing or their um, glutes will start contracting. Um, it's usually involuntary because there's so much muscle tension happening and leading up to the orgasm phase. Um, the plateau phase of the muscle tension is more muscles are involved and more contraction can be seen such as fingers and toes curling hip thrusting, glutes engaging, neck rigidity, and a pain grimace. Um, during the orgasm phase, the muscle tension threshold um, peak has been reached. We'll talk a little bit more about how the orgasm happens with that muscle tension in the orgasm episode. And then in a resolution phase, the muscles immediately relax. Um, the urethra in the arousal phase, or in the during the during arousal is the posterior wall of the bladder and the urethra is irritated after repeated penile thrusting. So that's the part that is obviously 
closest to the vagina. Those who have complained of postcoital dysuria, basically postcoital painful urethra or urination, had a high perineum constriction of the vaginal outlet. Um, these structures combine to hold and direct the penis along the anterior wall during mounting and active coition. Sex. Given the slang term honeymoon or bride's cystitis, these symptoms can last as long as two to three days after an episode of extended penis in vagina or basically vaginal intercourse or penetration or a session that irritates the urethra externally or internally. So basically it's just if you're having an extended period of, of vaginal penetration or um, vulvar stimulation, the urethra can be irritated. Or if you're having a lot of sex, it maybe just might be shorter on the shorter end of time, um, but you're having a lot of it. It's just, it's causing it's just causing a lot of friction to the urethra, and it's just giving it irritation. And um, some women will complain that even though they urinate after sex, they're still having pain with urination and a constant feeling of needing to go to the bathroom even days after a um, sexual episode. And they go to the doctor and their urine tests are negative for any kind of infection and the doctor can't say anything wrong. Well, it's probably just bride cystitis. You probably just irritated the urethra. It's some inflammation, some irritation. And if you start noticing this is, that this is the pattern, this is probably the reason is you're just putting too much um, irritation onto the urethra and you'll have to take steps necessary to mitigate that irritation. The rectum during arousal is an involuntary rectal sphincter contraction um, during orgasm, um, but it can also happen during arousal as well because you're having penetration uh, or you're having, um, sometimes when a woman is aroused, even if she's not, not having an orgasm, the vagina will contract. Those muscles will just do like a, like one contraction or one or two contractions. It's not an orgasm, but because the muscles are starting to have a lot of tension, sometimes it can be like a wave contraction and that will involve the rectum as well. Um, other body parts and systems that are involved during late excitation and plateau phase include a hyperventilation, so faster breathing, faster heart rate, which is the tachycardia, increase in systolic blood pressure, which you're not really gonna notice, um, perspiration, runny nose, like I mentioned earlier. The labia majora will flatten and spread and fill with blood. The labia minora um, will, so the inner labia, um, increases at least two to three times in diameter due to vasocongestion, and there can be vivid color changes. Not everybody is this two to three times in diameter due to vasocongestion, <laughs> but um, this is this is kind of like what they saw on an average. Um, either way, there's increase in size and a, a deepening in color, or more or more vivid color changes. Um, the Bart glands, which you may have seen on, let me pull up the vulva and clit anatomy again. If you look here on the very bottom, it'll show the opening of the right Bart gland they're on both sides. They produce a minimal amount of lubrication and typically not a sufficient amount to accomplish more than minimal lubrication of the vaginal um, opening. Introitus is the opening. Um, gland activity is stimulated most effectively by long continued coital connection. So obviously if you're having a long vaginal penetration session, outer labia area there at the very bottom of the vaginal opening and whatnot is gonna start to have a lot of friction um, a lot of friction stimulation and friction burn, and you're gonna need to have some lubrication created, and the Bart gland pretty much really kicks into gear to, do, to, to help with that friction long-term. What anatomic changes occur in the clitoris during periods of sexual stimulation? Um, during the excitement phase, whether visually noticeable or not, engorgement happens via the tumescence. Um, a lengthening and widening of the clitoral shaft happens, increased blood flow to the clitoral cavernosa and labial arteries resulting in increased clitoral intracavernosal pressure 
protrusion of the glans clitoris. So basically, it gets a little erection. It gets harder, it gets bigger, it gets longer, wider. Um, during the plateau phase, the clitoral body, so the shaft and the glands, retracts So um, from the normal pudendal overhang position. So the clitoris kind of sucks back a little bit under the hood. The clitoral body retraction reaction fre frequently causes a partner to lose, I put usually a male on there, because uh, only because a female many times will already know that, it, so if a female partner will already know that continuing stimulation will still feel good to the one receiving it. So a female partner isn't necessarily gonna know that the clitoris is retracting a little bit, but she's gonna know to keep going with the stimulation. A male partner who doesn't have a clit isn't necessarily gonna know that the clitoris retracts the more aroused the woman gets. And so a lot of times men lose the clitoris and then they spend time trying to find it. Having lost contact with the clitoris, the male partner usually ceases active stimulation of the general mons area and attempts manually to relocate the clitoral bo the body. By the time the clitoral shaft has been relocated, the plateau phase or the super arousal phase tension levels may have been lost and the female may not recover from the interruption in stimulation. So she may have lost, she may, might be like, it still kind of feels good, but it's not where it was before you lost it. Well, so if you, despite whether you're male or female, feel like you have lost the clitoris during stimulation and the, and the receiver is in high arousal, just keep going with what you're doing. <laughs> Don't try to find it. <laughs> it's still there. Um, it is important to emphasize that the retracted clitoral body continues to be stimulated by the traction or pressure on the protective clitoral hood. Once plateau phase clitoral retraction has been established, manual, Manipulation of the general mons area is all that is necessary for effective clitoral body stimulation. So don't go looking for it. You might be like, it was erect and now it's gone. Did I lose it? Is she no longer having a good time? Did it, did it like go soft and it's no longer hard and aroused? No, it's still there. It's still hard. It's still aroused. It just retracts. The ligaments like pulled it back under the hood even further. So just keep doing exactly what you were doing unless told to do something else but if you have not been told to do something else <laughs> keep doing exactly what you've been doing and you'll get the person where she, they need to go what anatomic changes occur in the vagina during different phases of sexual response um, during the excitement phase within 10 to 30 seconds of the initiation of any form of effective stimulation sexual stimulation, lubrication material appears on the walls of the vagina, similar to when sweat appears on the skin. And I showed you that a minute ago, the vaginal lubrication image, that's gonna get really big again here, you'll see the lubricating droplets, right? So that's that can happen 10 to 30 seconds after the initiation of any form of effective sexual stimulation. <laughs> uh, basic vaginal lubrication develops in a transudate-like reaction through the vaginal walls. The vaginal barrel expands and lengthens. Vaginal walls change to a darker purplish hue of vasocongestion. So obviously it's gonna change a little bit darker of color and the vaginal lubrication reaches full potential. During the excitement phase, during the plateau phase, um, there is marked localized vasocongestion in the lower third of the vaginal barrel creating a, up to a 50% constriction of the central lumen. Uh, and I'm gonna pull that up really quick. So here is the plateau phase of the vagina. You can see that there's that orgasmic platform. Um, and so that's the outer third of the vagina basically swelling um, from vasocongestion and, and, and arousal. So that's where it feels really, really good. <laughs> um, up towards the cervix and, and the, um, your, the uterus, it isn't as in, um, full of nerves. And so it doesn't feel as good as down by that lower third. Um, so take note, men who um, think you have to have this massively long penis to provide us any kind of pleasure. Yeah, there's, you know, 
some women who really, really like to have their cervix stimulated and, and there's certain times of the month that, that that's really nice as well. But honestly, that lower third is where all of our nerves and pleasure is. That's the plateau phase. Minimal further increase in width and depth of the barrel. So the um, vaginal canal or barrel, as it's referred to, um, lengthens and widens. If you think, if anybody thinks that a vagina feels loose, this loose vagina thing that everybody likes to go on about, it means that the woman is highly aroused and um, we should stop shaming women for what you think feels like a loose vagina and um, start seeing it for what it is and that is a highly aroused vagina. Um, so maybe we can kind of turn some of that bad women's anatomy around. Um, unless there's like some major anatomical structural damage to, to the vagina, there is no loose vagina. If you're experiencing what you feel as a loose vagina, um, it's a highly aroused vagina. Um, so maybe instead of complaining and making fun of and shaming people, maybe you should start feeling good about the fact that you caused that to happen. A, moving on, <laughs> a vaginal lubrication production rate slows during the plateau phase especially if the same level of sexual tension is experienced for an extended period. So if the woman isn't getting, it's a, basically, if the woman isn't getting any closer to an orgasm and things are kind of just staying as is, the vaginal lubrication slows. There's, there's theories as to why, it could be distraction. Um, it could just be that, I mean, she's no longer having fun and might want to change things up and is too afraid to say so, or she's not getting the stimulation that she needs to reach orgasm. Or it could just be that her body is deciding that it's done, um, especially if you're going for a long period. Regardless of whether she's on the verge of orgasm or not, the vagina is not necessarily meant to go for a really long time. The vagina's sweet spot, the vagina's Goldilocks sweet spot is anywhere from five to 15 minutes. Any longer than that, and it starts to not be as lubricated as it was before. Um, the base of the vasocongestion, which encompasses the entire outer third of the vagina, together with the engorged labia minora, provides anatomical foundation for the vagina's physiological expression of the orgasmic experience. This area of the plateau phase vasocongestion congestion has been termed the orgasm platform. And I showed you the plateau phase and then we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the orgasmic, or the orgasmic platform, which is different than talking in the orgasm episode. So here you can see the orgasmic platform. The, you can see where it says the lung, lengthening of the cul-de-sac. Um, so yeah, the vagina lengthens and widens. But then there, um, right there at the outer third of the vaginal opening, or the, vag the vagina there is the orgasmic platform. Um, that's where the contractions happen. That's where all of that swelling and congestion happens. And all that fabulous feel goodness. It's created involuntarily by the localized vasocongestion congestion and muscle tension. There is a, also just a, a little side note of the vaginal changes during arousal is a seminal pool. Um, let me pull the orgasm phase back up. This doesn't show it, but back by the uterus, when a woman is laying on her back, down by the, by the cervix, the um, because the orgasm platform has caused that constriction, the rest of the vagina does not have that constriction and thus forms something called a seminal pool. And so when she's laying on her back, it can make it more difficult for this for the semen to come back out because of just how gravity works. Um, and then during the orgasmic phase, the vagina, the rhythmic contractions are localized to the outer third of the vaginal barrel where the orgasm platform has been created. Um, so that's what's happening in the vagina. Um, then we have the, what are the anatomic changes that occur to the uterus during the different phases of sexual responses? We have the excitement phase. As excitement phase levels of sexual tension progress toward the plateau phase, the entire uterus elevates. 
um, the cervix slowly retracts from its resting position in a posterior and superior plane as the vaginal walls expand. The elevation of the uterus, the cervix together with the involuntary expanding of the anterior and lateral vaginal walls creates a tenting effect of the transcervical depths of the vaginal barrel. So the uterus is elevates into the pelvic cavity and the um, cervix at the back of the vaginal barrel, you know, creates this tenting and lengthening effect. There's not really anything that you can obviously see or feel or anything like that. Um, it's just some information about kind of what's happening, just the anatomical changes. In the plateau phase, full elevation completes during the plateau phase. An obvious uterus size increase increases during plateau phase was observed due to vasocongestion congestion in those who had given birth. And so during, in, in imaging, when we were able to image, you know, the various people, um, we saw that the uterine size increases during the plateau phase um, in those who had given birth. Results were not so obvious in those who had never been pregnant. Um, loss of vasocongestion congestion was completed from 10 to 20 minutes after orgasm. So that, that pelvic vasocongestion congestion um, fully resolved 10 to 20 minutes after the orgasm. In the orgasm phase, there is an identifiable recurrent pattern of uterine muscle contract contractility that is orientated specifically to the orgasm phase. Okay, so um, there's a sucking effect theory for sperm migration. So there's, there's some reports out there that the uterus sucks sperm in from the vagina in order to help with reproduction in that the cervix dips into that seminal pool while the uterus sucks it up, right? Um, we've known that this is not true since Masters and Johnson's decades ago, um, literally from imaging with contrast. So the corpus contractions start in the fundus, so the top of the uterus, and work down through the midzone and terminate in the lower uterine segment. So the uterus is contracting from the top down. Now, I don't have my own imaging and contrast to tell you, and seminal pool to tell you whether there is a, or, you know, or a vacuum meter to tell whether there's a sucking effect, but the uterus is contracting from the top of the uterus down. Okay, um, generally where the observance of this pulsing cervix comes from, um, so the uterus has been proven to contract from the top down. The cervix in contact with radio-opaque material, the contrast material, provided no evidence of sucking effect into the uterus. A strong expelling force is created inside the corpus during orgasm, expelling menstrual blood in spurts, further supporting the concept of expulsive rather than ingestive sucking reactions of the corpus to effective sexual stimulation. So I don't care what TV show, what person says about how the cervix dips into the seminal pool to allow the uterus to suck semen inside of it to help with reproduction. Um, the uterus, uterine literally contracts from the top down, and if there's menstrual blood inside, it expels the menstrual blood. So you cannot tell me that during a menstrual period that it expels the blood, but any other time during the month it sucks things in, not how it works. So <laughs> the uterine does not have a sucking um, effect. So during res resolution phase, the only definitive response of the cervix to sexual stimulation develops with in the resolution phase. What happens is minimal dilation of the external cervical os has been observed. If this reaction occurs, it does so immediately after orgasm. If no orgasm occurs, then the, then the dilation of the cervix does not occur. So while the uterus is expelling or having you know that downward um, contraction, the cervix is opening very, very small, obviously, a very, very small opening. It's not like it's gaping like it would for like 
childbirth or anything like that. Um, but it does, you know, open a little bit to allow for semen and sperm to go up through it. Pregnancy and the sexual response. When the nulliparous woman, or rather a female who has never given birth, so null, uh, when the nulliparous woman responds to sexual stimuli in the first trimester, so it's not that like she's never been pregnant, because she's obviously pregnant, she's just never given birth, right? So when she responds to sexual stimuli in the first trimester of her pregnancy, venous congestion of the breast is more obvious than in the non-pregnant state. During the second and third trimester, there is usually a marked reduction in the nulliparous complaint of breast tenderness during sexual stimulation. Many women express awareness of increased levels of sexual tension as each trimester progresses as a marked increase in the vascularity of the pelvic viscera. The, the mechanism of fetal support creates gross vasoconcentration in the female pelvis. So because that baby is growing in there, there's a lot more uh, vascular activity and vascular congestion. Um, so while not every pregnant female gets hornier as, as the months go by. If you are one who gets hornier as the months go by, this is why. It's because you're getting significantly more vasocongestion congestion that you are more aware of and responsive to. You know, it's filling your genitals with blood, filling with genital, genitals, <laughs> if I could talk, filling your genitals with blood is going to make you aroused. Um, for the multi paris women, so women who have given, um, birth multiple times, there is a tendency for the major and minoral labia to be excessively engorged with blood and frequently quite um, edematous, so red. Many pregnant women report vaginal lubrication developed more rapidly and more extensively, but this is not indica indicative of it being the normal. So um, there again, being pregnant, you have more um, vascular things happening in your genitals. And so obviously you're going to have more vas vaso congestion and more easily vaginally lubricated as the norm, obviously not with everybody. The outer third of the vaginal barrel um, during the third trimester does not show a significant, as significant of orgasmic contraction. I didn't really look into why to be perfectly honest, I didn't look into why. It just is a, a fact that I thought I would put out there. If you really want to know why, just Google that. Just put um, that specific thing there and it should bring you up some articles of, of, what's, of what's happening. Resolution phase reaction during pregnancy differs severely from that in the non-pregnant state um, in that the vasocongested pelvis frequently is not relieved completely with orgasmic experience, which may account for the higher sexual tension levels that they had encountered in non-pregnant states. So it's obviously that higher vasocongestion. congestion. Um, and even though normally when you orgasm, that blood is able to just, you know, go back, just kind of like a penis, right? You have the orgasm, the blood can flow back to, <laughs> to everywhere else. But when, if you're pregnant, that, um, release of all that tension just happens slower. Um, sexual responses are typically delayed and muted in the postpartum woman up to about the 90 day mark and can, and can occur later in each phase than they did in the women prior to pregnancy. Um, this is due to the hormone balances, possibly breastfeeding, hormone balances, pelvic tension, pain, etc. So yeah, during postpartum and if you're breastfeeding, the hormones are all, are all over the place. Um, there's a lot of recovery, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of um, pelvic floor issues. And so sexual response is gonna be different. Um, and it's gonna take time to get back to normal. Um, there's a great variation was reported in the levels of eroticism and effectiveness of sexual performance among the pregnant women that were interviewed. Reports, this was from Masters and Johnson's, reports ranges from voluntary rejection of all physical forms of sexual activity during the entire pregnancy, all the way up to deliberate prostitution because of the um, amount of sexual tension and arousal that, that women had, and they just wanted to, just they just wanted orgasm and feel better. Um, orgasms have the potential to send a woman into labor late 
in the third trimester of pregnancy. But as with all else, this is a case by case scenario. So where that comes from, that old wife tells, you know, oh, just go have an orgasm, you know, go into labor. Well, if you remember a couple minutes ago, I talked about how the uterus contracts from the top down. If you are someone who has a really strong orgasm that or, or um, rather a really strong uterine response to orgasm, or if you happen to just be somebody who has a strong uterus response to orgasm while pregnant, you can start a trigger of labor contractions. They might not go into full labor contractions, but this is, you know, they have the potential. Sexual response after menopause. We'll go to menopause now. Nipple erection still occurs. Breast enlargement still occurs due to vascular congestion, but no one over 60 typically shows clinically visual signs. So while it's still happening, um, if you're over 60, you generally can't um, tell. Um, intensity of all of the physical reactions is usually diminished, typically due to lower levels of the sexual hormones and aging cardiovascular abilities. So they're obviously going to have an effect on plumpness, vessel congestion, um, the constrictions, the nerves, um, all of the um, sexual hormones and cardiovascular abilities are going to function these things or are going to affect these things, sorry. Resolution phase typically occurs a little quicker than in those still in reproductive age as the cardiovascular system has declined and so thus has the vasocongestion abilities. For example, the sex flush, breast tissue, breast tissue enlarge, engorgement, labial engorgement, and color changes. Um, you're just not getting as much vasocongestion and what you do have returns back to normal more quickly. Uh, as women age and lose their sex steroid levels, uterine contractions occurring with orgasm frequently become painful, and most notably after the age of 60, where some are so distressed with these contractions that they purposefully avoid orgasmic experience and even coital connection. Of note, these pains are relieved when the postmenopausal woman takes estrogen and progesterone together. Um, so the estrogen is obviously going to help with all of your sexual functioning. Then the progesterone is going to um, protect the uterus from too much estrogen and not enough counterbalance, right? So it's basically just a loss of the hormones. The saying, use it or lose it, is of great reliability for those post-menopause. Frequent use of the tissues and arousal mechanisms have shown to provide a more reliable and quicker response from the tissues than in those who participate more infrequently. So, um, I don't want to, you know, make you think that if you don't use it, that you're going to lose it. But the more you use it, as long as you're enjoying using it, let's make that caveat, as long as you're enjoying using, using it and the more you use it, the more those tissues will function quicker, easier, and more reliably and feel better because you're maintaining the the memory of those structures right they're like oh i know what to do i know what to do like i got this when you're you know going through menopause or you're in menopause or you pass menopause that whole thing the less you use it the less they're like okay cool i guess we're done and i can rest and just go on my merry way and have my own hobbies it's, it's a sad fact but it's true i'm sorry and that's it for arousal so I will be sure to get the last episode, which is on orgasm specifically, um, recorded here in the next few days and uploaded for everyone. So be sure to check back or um, make sure to, that you go watch that episode as well. So you can kind of, so that you make sure that you are getting the full educational experience. Yeah, and subscribe so that you can make sure that you are alerted to when I upload um, videos on other topics. Thanks for watching.